John McWilliams on behalf of the Oak Historical Society. I welcome you to our annual lecture series. Um, primary mission of the Historical Society is to promote and preserve history. And this is part of that mission. We want to think of a better way than to offer this lecture series. And I might add, while I'm thinking of the prior uh, coming up after today, just to remind you a bit that we think we have a really uh, pretty terrific program this year. Um, next month, coinciding with President's Day weekend, actually, we're looking at the most interesting presence of the 20th century, interesting being the opposite of work there. Uh, not with the greatest impact, most effective, most successful, but interesting. I have no idea who our speaker thinks are the most interesting, but, but uh, we'll find out in a few weeks. And then in March, um, our third speaker, looking at um, protest music, uh, normally uh, tended. I think that's kind of synonymous with the 1960s, which of course it was, but this is more than that. This is the 1960s involved the labor movement, uh, so I think uh, uh, that will be a very important experience for us as well. Um, the, um, oh, uh, something. The, the uh, marketing department has asked me uh, to get some feedback on who you are, where you come from, starting with how you discovered us. That is how you found out of it. Was it through primarily a bookmark? Uh, could I just ask for a quick show of hands, if you don't mind? Okay. How about uh, one of the two local newspapers? Ah, great. All right. Uh, word of mouth. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, Facebook or some such one. So we're here. All right. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. I appreciate that very much. Um, this, uh, oh, I also wanted to be sure to thank um, the superintendent uh, Bicker of the Belton School District uh, for allowing us to use this facility and the Belton Standard Journal and the Sunbury Daily Item for giving us such great coverage about our, our program here.
this guest speaker is one reason why, part of that great experience for me. St. Francis University, by the way, for those who may not be familiar with it, a uh, relatively small school population, just a few miles west of Altoona. I first encountered our speaker when he was a student in my American in the 1960s class for over a year ago. Now, last semester he enrolled in another one of my classes. I stepped out of my 20th century uh, world for a semester while teaching a course called Civil War Reconstruction Era. So imagine what it has been like for me standing in front of the classroom knowing that in the back of my class, when we got to Gettysburg, there was a person there who knew at least as much, if not more, about that battle than I did. And so I decided I was going to exploit him for all of his work. <laughs> <laughs> so when Morgan was speaking about the kid, I said, is that right, Tyler? And he said, right, got that? So there, and that's his office. Tyler is one of those students professors love having in class. A very promising young talent. He's curious, serious, and dedicated. But he's more than that. On campus, he demonstrated leadership qualities by conducting tours for the university's World War II Museum. He was an RA, or in university jargon, that's a res uh, resident assistant. Uh, in a dorm, meaning he had to sometimes play good guy, bad guy, which is almost certainly a no-win situation or can be. He was vice president of the history club. As a work-study student, he participated in numerous volunteer activities, including distributing food and furniture to families living in poverty. Um, he was an Eagle Scout. He did it all. He is also an accomplished researcher who is currently working on a project tentatively titled, On This Ground We Were Making History, How Gettysburg Monument Dedications Reveal Civil War Memory. I think this has potential for publication in a scholarly journal, which is a rare accomplishment for an undergraduate. Indeed, it would be an extraordinary achievement for someone at this point in his career. In fact, in fact, as I recall that by now thousands of students that I have encountered over my a career that I now measure in decades rather than years, I cannot recall one student who has done this. It got my attention one day in class, just before class started, and I'm ch chatting with students a bit, as I'd like to do before we get underway. And I said, what are you doing this summer? I said, well, I'm going to be working in Gettysburg. I have an internship. I said, oh, wow. Very cool. Go ahead and be unusual and unique experience. In that capacity, as an intern, this was a pain internship, by the way, huge difference, right? Pain internship. And at Gettysburg, Tyler had the unique opportunity to work in the archives there using primary sources to create, research, and present interpreter programs about that battlefield. Mindful that history is always a story about people, he decided to look at the personal side of Gettysburg's soldiers using war records, handwritten letters, diaries, <coughs> and wove them into, together into narratives of the soldiers who fought and died there. Over the course of that summer, Tyler gave dozens of tours in groups ranging from 20 to 200 people. He may be our youngest speaker in this series, but his youth should not be mistaken for lack of experience. He is seasoned. I know that firsthand. When my wife and I visited Gettysburg one day last June and arranged with Tyler to take us on a personal tour of the cemetery. Whatever concerns I had about how he might perform as part of this series uh, were almost immediately uh, satisfied when uh, I was able to observe the way he interacted not with us but with other tourists and his information and how he really um, made it um, interesting, if not fascinating. He told us stories intimate stories about people's lives as we stood in front of grave sites so that we could relate, so we could almost connect with 
these people. I read something about their backgrounds and how, how their lives were interrupted by war and ultimately, tragically, cut short. I knew that if he could handle all of those hundreds of diverse visitors at Gettysburg and the interesting questions they brought with them, he'd be okay with this crowd. Tyler is currently a graduating senior planning to spend this summer at Gettysburg uh, before starting graduate school in the fall where he will focus his career in uh, public history. And after that, hopes to find employment where else? The National Park Historic Site. So please give a special warm welcome to Tyler this morning, I'm sorry, this afternoon. Talk to us about plants cut short, stories from the Gettysburg National Cemetery. Today, we're going to be telling the stories of a couple soldiers buried here um, who, like you and I, uh, had many plans for their futures but uh, were ultimately cut short whenever the war came along. Um, and by, ex uh, by exploring these plans cut short, uh, we'll be able to walk away uh, today with a greater understanding of the sacrifices and the meaning of, of war and the Civil War. Um, so yeah, so first here. Yeah, a little bit about me. Um, I already mentioned his senior in St. Francis. I'm from Tyrone, PA. Uh, again, that's pretty close to St. Francis, just between uh, State College and Altoona, if you're unfamiliar where that is. Um, and yeah, so my internship was at Gettysburg. So uh, why Gettysburg? How did I come about that? Um, well, I was looking for my summer internship, and a professor of mine sent me an email with an application That's pretty interesting. That's not something that you hear every day. That's not a job that you really think about every day. And in fact, well, you know, I'll give it a shot. And um, after getting accepted and getting the job, uh, you know, I, I was there all last summer. And like Dr. McWilliams said, I gave interpretive tours uh, in the cemetery around the battlefield and really helped uh, people understand the history that occurred. Um, so before we get on with the uh, soldiers that we're going to talk about, I always like to orient ourselves a little bit and kind of get us into the mindset of the time period that we're, we're taking a look at. So um, how did the Battle of Gettysburg come to be? Now, uh, I was going to ask how many have been to Gettysburg, but clearly almost all of us have. Um, so I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with the story, but uh, even if you are very familiar with it, it's always nice to uh, kind of refresh. And if you're not familiar, it's a great little introduction to the story that happened there. So, the year is 1863, um, around mid-year, mid around June 1863, and so we have our two armies, the Army of Northern Virginia, the Confederate Army, and the Army of the Potomac, the Union Army. After a, a couple of losses at the battles of Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville in the months prior, the Union Army retreated back in and around Washington, D.C., and the Confederate Army, after those victories, was ready for more. And so, as we get into June, uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee uh, decided that now was the time to move his army into the north, to take the battle on northern soil. Up to this point, the entirety of the war had almost been fought in Virginia and in other southern states, and border states such as Maryland. But um, he figured, that what a better time than now after these victories heading up there. Now, there were a couple reasons as to why he wanted to go north. First. Um, obviously, if he got a very, very big, convincing victory in the North, that might convince the citizens of the North to want to call for peace and end the war. Some other reasons, uh, like I said, since the majority of the war had been fought in Virginia, um, 
the, the, the state was kind of uh, run dry, out of food, supplies, materials, things like that. And so Lee's army was also running dry on those vital things that they needed to, to run an army. And so he said, uh, Pennsylvania, very you know, farming rich state, plenty of resources there, we'll head up into there and uh, grab some food and supplies along the way. Another uh, point, and the final point as to why he thought this, which many kind of tend to overlook, is about uh, foreign intervention. He figures that if he can go up north and win a battle on northern soil, he'll be able to convince other countries like Britain, France, other European powers that uh, the Confederacy is a legitimate uh, army and they're a legitimate state, and then they, that they can receive support financially, militarily, things like that to help them win the war. Um, so those are a few of Lee's reasons as to why he wants to go north. And so, uh, again, in early June, he will begin his journey up north into Pennsylvania. And so, uh, on the other side, the Union Army, again, after these defeats, a little battered and beaten. Um, there, again, just kind of defending the D.C. area. Uh, at the time, they were under command of a general named Joseph Hooker, and um, he was in charge of the battles at Chancellorville and such. And President Lincoln wasn't too happy with his... Uh, his leadership with the way he handled the battles, and so uh, only two days before the Battle of Gettysburg, he would hand uh, the army over to a man by the name of uh, George Gordon Meade. And so here on the left we have General Meade and uh, General Lee. And so these will be our two uh, main leaders during the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm sure many of you know this. And um, so at this point, uh, the, once the Confederate Army begins its movements, the Union Army will mirror it and follow its movements as well. Now, President Lincoln doesn't want D.C. completely undefended, and so this means that the Union Army moves at a much slower rate. And so the Confederates get into Pennsylvania far quicker than the Union do, and um, this kind of is setting up for a, a large battle to occur soon. Nobody knows when, nobody knows where, but there will be a battle happening within the next coming month or so. And so, um, eventually, like I said, June 28th, the Army's turned over to General Meade, but on June 30th, Confederates are in and around the area of towns surrounding Gettysburg looking for supplies. Uh, they send in a group of uh, scouts to go and take a look to see uh, what type of supplies are in there, and they come back to their, to their base uh, the day that, that evening and say, there are Union troops in the town of Gettysburg. There's Union cavalry in the town. Uh, the Confederate um, general, Henry Heath says that you didn't see any uh, Union cavalry. The Union Army is so much farther away. You saw some local militia. We're going to go in the next morning on the 1st, and we're going to get those, those, those resources that we need. Well, sure enough, the soldiers were right in thinking that there was Union troops there. There was Union cavalry there under the command of General John Buford. And so the next morning comes, and uh, the Confederates march into Gettysburg, and the Union cavalrymen uh, begin the battle. They slow the, they begin to slow the Confederate troops, and the battle begins around 7:30 in the morning on July 1st. Now, again, I won't give too much detail since many of you have been to Gettysburg, um, but the, the beginning of the day, if you take a look at each of these maps, the first day is on the left here, and you can see most of the fighting takes place sort of northwest of the town of Gettysburg, eventually ending in a Union retreat uh, back through the town taking up a position known as Cemetery Hill and Cemetery Ridge. And this is where the battle will be fought for the next two days. On day two, um, you can see in the middle there, uh, the Union troops sort of start to resemble what we call the fishhook formation. Uh, but uh, the third corps of the Union Army, if you see that little uh, jut out of the, uh, the blue there in the middle, um, they kind of move out into position and a majority of the fighting on the second day happens uh, there, in places known as the Wheat Field and the Peach Orchard, which we will cover a little bit more later. Some of our guys fought there themselves. Um, and again, the second day ends in sort of almost a stalemate. The Union Army is alive, the Confederates are on the attack, and then we head into the third day for this final uh, epic of this battle. And so we go into the third day, and again, now the Union Army is in that complete official formation, and the, the Confederates General Lee decides. Let's hit them on each side. The, the attacks are repulsed, so he decides let's take them right up the middle, a full frontal assault, and um, this is what's known as Pickett's Charge. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And that is pretty much what ends the Battle of Gettysburg. Pickett's Charge occurs, the Union Army repulses it, 
Lee has, has been defeated. He's been held off for three days in a row. And then starting July 4th, he will return uh, back to Virginia, never to come back to uh, the North again. So, um, after this battle, this, this was, like it says, the bloodiest battle of the war. Um, you know, I, I brushed over that very, very vaguely, very, very quickly. Um, but over 50,000 uh, men, that by the end of it, were casualties, either killed, wounded, or captured. Um, this, this would become the bloodiest battle of the Civil War. Now, with all these men injured, wounded, and killed, they need a place to, to bury them. Um, you know, many of these soldiers, uh, if their families were more wealthy, they could pay some money to have their, their uh, son or father, whoever, have them shipped home and buried in the local cemetery. Uh, but many, many of these, uh, these people, were they were just young boys, and their families came from farming families, things like that, who didn't have the money to be able to bring their bodies home. So that is whenever the development of the National Cemetery uh, came into mind. So um, <coughs> a man by the name of uh, David Wills, he was a prominent uh, lawyer in the town of Gettysburg. He uh, purchased some land on top of Cemetery Hill, one of the main parts of the battlefield, and uh, along with some support of the Pennsylvania governor, Andrew Curtin, uh, they purchased some land to uh, set aside for a national cemetery to bury the dead uh, from Gettysburg. So, um, I will be discussing a little bit about the design of the cemetery and the history behind the cemetery before I get into our soldier story. So if you take a look at the map here, you can kind of see um, the half circle shape there. And the cemetery was designed by a man named William Saunders. And so, that sort of half circle, circle shape was to represent uh, equality. There's a couple different uh, ideas of equality. Uh, equality in the sense that all the men gave uh, their lives. They all gave an equal sacrifice of their lives. So that half circle, no jagged edges. And then you'll see later on with some pictures, uh, all of the graves are flat to the ground. There's no different size to headstone. And again, that is to represent that equality uh, again. And then uh, not buried by rank. The only way of burial is by state. And you can see the different state plots cut out on that map. Um, yes. And then in the center of that half circle is the Soldiers National Monument. And there are four um, images for people on that monument. It might be a little hard to see. Uh, but on the front there, there's two up front. Uh, there's the image of war. It's a, depicted as a Union soldier, uh, tired from the war, telling his story to the lady sitting next to him, which is the muse of history. She has a pen and a tablet out, and she is writing what the soldier is telling her, writing it in the history books. Uh, on top, we have Lady Liberty. Uh, she stands tall above everything else. And then around back, there are two more, um, a man and a woman, one representing peace and one representing uh, industry during peacetime. So um, a little bit of metaphors in, in, in the people uh, that we see there. So. Uh, now, before we get into those soldiers that are buried with the plots around, I always like to mention, uh, well first, I'll tell you their names. Uh, so these are the uh, three guys that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the first one, his name is Pliny White, he's from the 14th Vermont Infantry. Uh, the second is Edmund Dascombe from the 2nd New Hampshire Infantry. And the third is Nelson Jones from the 3rd Maine Infantry. Um, <clears throat> but what I wanted to get at was, before we get to them, I always like to uh, point out the unknowns in the cemetery, all the plans and stories that we don't have and that we don't know. Um, there's a little uh, under, I believe, 1,500 uh, unknown soldiers buried in the National Cemetery, and uh, buried completely unknown. You can see on the left those little white stones. Those are completely unknown. We don't know anything about them, uh, who they were, things like that, what unit they fought for. Uh, the ones on the right, uh, they're within the state plot, so we were able to identify their state, maybe their regiment, but not their name. And so um, this became because there were no dog tags during the Civil War, and so uh, if they didn't write it on a piece of paper on them, put it in their pocket, anything like that, um, there was no way of identifying them if nobody knew who they were. But yeah, so our first soldier, uh, Pliny White, um, he was part of the 14th Vermont Infantry, uh, they were called the Nine Monthers. Um, he was from Whitening, Vermont, which uh, I don't know if any of you have heard that. I, I didn't. Uh, it only has a population of about 400 today, so it comes from a very, very, very small town. 
Uh, he enlisted on August 11, 1862, and uh, we know so much about him because uh, his, his mother was very good at keeping all of his letters and all of the family's letters. Uh, there is a book written, uh, it was a, it's a compilation of all the family letters during the wartime. Uh, I don't recall the name, uh, but um, that's why we, we know so much about him. So uh, up until this point, uh, his unit hadn't seen any action until Gettysburg. Uh, they were a part of a major part of the defense of the D.C. area, stationed in many forts in and around the capital. Uh, but the, after the losses at Chancellorsville and Fredericksburg, the Army needed some more reinforcements, so they brought the, this Vermont unit into the Army of the Potomac. Um, and again, when they get here on July 2nd, they don't see any action on the 2nd, but on the 3rd during Pickett's charge during the massive final attack, um, there are reinforcements needed, and so his units were brought up to the line to defend against Pickett's charge. Um, as I have here, uh, we can see on the map, I circled his unit uh, there on the, on the left map. So uh, during Pickett's charge, uh, he was a part of a whole brigade. Their regiment was a part of about three groups of Vermont regiments together, and they actually they swung out sort of around and sort of cut off a majority of Confederate cement from Florida and South Carolina. And they actually ended up capturing a lot of Confederates during, during the charge. And then the monument on the right there, that is the monument that's there at Gettysburg today. Um, that is the monument to the 14th uh, Vermont. So, uh, what were what Pliny's plans? What did he want to do? Well, he was a very religious man. He actually wanted to be a minister. That was his plan. Um, and uh, yeah, he also wanted to get married. And so he was engaged to a woman named Lumira. And uh, But on July 3rd, he was injured during the battle. He got hit in the arm. And so they rushed him to the Seminary Field Hospital after the battle. He seemed to be, be recovering very, very well. Um, he wrote a lot of letters afterwards. Um, one thing that I, I found interesting was that uh, he was right-handed, but his right arm got shot and it had to be amputated. And so uh, all of the letters that you read after um, the battle, his handwriting is fairly legible because he now has to write with his left hand. Um, but he seems to be very, very happy and he seems to be recovering well. Um, but most likely due to infection, things like that, there were some complications. And he passed away on August 5th, 1863, so a little over a month after the battle. Uh, and I had mentioned that he wanted to uh, marry a woman named Lumira. Well, uh, after he passed away, a letter was found uh, in his uniform to her that he wrote on the morning of the battle. So I'll read that for you now. So he says, Dear Lumira, the chances are very favorable today that we shall go into battle. Though it is said that we are to be held in reserve, I do not doubt that before the fight is over, I shall be called. I am ready and willing to go into battle, and can trust myself in the hands of him who is our only trust. Though I do not fear, yet it may be, if I go into battle, this may be the last time I shall write you. Already the firing has commenced, but not briskly. I would like to see you, but as I cannot, I thought just a word would be better than nothing. I love you as ever and think of you often, and if we meet no more on earth, I hope I shall be worthy to meet you, for there will be no parting word. Your affectionate, mine. So as you can see, a very, very heartfelt letter. Um, and that's going to be a very common theme with these men. These men are very skilled at writing. They, they, they really can convey their thoughts through words. Um, so moving on to our next soldier, Edmund Dascombe. He's a part of the 2nd New Hampshire Infantry Regiment. Um, and during the battle, he fought in the Peach Orchard, which I had mentioned a little bit earlier on the second day. Um, might be a little bit hard to see, uh, but if you look in the top left of the image on the left, you can see the little arrow going down towards the other group cluster in the, in the bottom. Uh, that is the second New Hampshire. During that battle, or during the battle on that day, um, the, the group of South Carolinians were making a charge at the uh, the other Union troops there, and so the second New Hampshire, they also did a counter charge back to them. And they were one of the first units there in the Peach Orchard that day, and they were actually one of the last units out of the Peach Orchard that day. So a very, very, very uh, veteran group. They, they've been around since the beginning of the war, since First Bull Run. Um, so they, they know what war it is. They know how it's fought, and they're, they're 
they're very good at what they do. Um, Edmund was actually a lieutenant, so he would have been um, a little higher up, and he, he would have been um, more looked at as more of a senior uh, person in, in the unit. Um, he enlisted on May 15, 1861, so again, he's been around since the beginning of the war. And um, so yeah, so a little bit about Edmund. So he attended Tufts College. Um, he was a teacher for about a year or so, and um, he actually was a poet. Before the war broke out, he wanted to uh, be a lawyer, and he, that was his plan, and he ended up enlisting in the Army. And, um, but I mentioned he was a poet, and he wrote a lot of poetry uh, before the war and during the war, up until the Battle of Gettysburg. And so I have two excerpts from two of his poems here that I'd like to read you. Uh, the first one comes uh, directly after he enlists. So right after he volunteers to fight, he writes this poem, and it's called The Volunteer's Farewell. So he says, for voices are calling us onward, in the name of the free and the brave, against the spite and malice of traitors, they have called us our country to save. And if, from the great field of conflict, our fate should be never to return, God save them from heartbreaking sorrow, whose affection forever must burn. So to me, I feel that this is kind of hopeful, more of a hopeful poem. Uh, he's, he's excited to fight for his country, to do what is right, and he can't wait to go off and be the hero. Um, but in the last poem that he ever writes, um, around May or June, before the Battle of Gettysburg, after two years of war, uh, this one is titled, The Dying Volunteer. So I'll read that for you now. He says, I am dying, brother, dying. See how fast my light blood flows, and I feel my soul is hiding, where in death it will find repose. Farewell, father, sister, mother. Farewell, all my friends so dear. Farewell world, I seek another, gasped the dying volunteer. So as you can see, much more grim outlook on the war after being exposed to it for over two years. Um, but Edmund had a lot of big plans, becoming a lawyer, obviously he's very good at poetry, college educated. Um, but others, and our final soldier, uh, wanted much more of a, of a simpler life than, than all of that. So, uh, oh, I apologize. There is Edmund's grave again. Just as anybody would like to see. Um, but our final soldier is named by the man, uh, man by the name of Nelson Jones. Uh, he was from the Third Maine uh, Infantry Unit, and uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, his unit was actually directly beside Edmund's unit, the Second New Hampshire. There's a very good chance that they could have seen each other uh, out there on the battlefield on July 2nd. Um, however, uh, I would I would say that the Third Maine is a little bit more well known for what it did in the morning. July 2nd before the battle, and um, we don't know where Nelson was injured, um, could have been uh, in the peach orchard along where the 2nd New Hampshire was, or it could have been uh, in the morning. So in the morning uh, of the 2nd, uh, the U.S., or the, the Union Army needed to uh, scout out a little group of trees known as Pitzer's Woods, and that's, you can see it on the map there, um, you see on the left side of the map, you can see 3rd Main along there. So. Third Maine, along with a group of sharpshooters, were tasked to go out and um, do a little reconnaissance in the woods to see where the Confederates were. And so, um, sure enough, they get up into the woods there, and there's three regiments from Alabama up there, and a skirmish breaks out, and eventually uh, the Union troops retreat. And uh, they complete their mission. They found where the Confederates were. Um, but, uh, you know, this, this, this could have been uh, where, where Nelson was injured eventually to pass away. Uh, so what about Nelson? I said he wanted much more of a simpler life. Uh, so his family, they were farmers from a small town in May, uh, Palermo, Maine. And uh, in his letters that he writes, uh, he, he's a very much a family man. He sends all of his money home to his family. Um, and he, he, he gets very homesick. He feels really bad that he can't be at home. And uh, one thing is that it seems like his father is struggling with some sort of chronic illness or something. Uh, because he constantly is apologizing to his father, saying, I know the work is hard for you, I know I wish I could be there, um, and things like that. And so, um, this is a quote from when he wrote his father, he says, I'm sorry your health is poor, I would like to be at home to help you about your spring work, which is soon coming. And um, one thing that stuck to me about Nelson was he always would talk about uh, eating apples and, and different fruits, and, and whatever season it was, he knew what was in the harvest, and in, just wanted to sit on the porch with his parents and eat apples. So um, I found that very, very much heartfelt. So 
Uh, as we can see, all three of these men uh, sacrificed uh, their future plans uh, for a much greater cause. Uh, now, a couple months after the battle, uh, President Lincoln would uh, come to Gettysburg uh, to give what is known as one of his most famous speeches, the Gettysburg Address. Um, I always say you can't talk about the Gettysburg Cemetery without talking about the Gettysburg Address, since that's what it's famous for. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of the story there and how it can relate to the soldiers that we're going to talk about. Um, so Lincoln's trip to Gettysburg. So he comes into Gettysburg on the night of November 18th at 1863. Up to this point, uh, Lincoln had barely, if at all, left Washington, D.C. Um, you know, it was wartime, he had a lot of business there, and it just wasn't very like him to get up and leave uh, during the middle of the war. But he felt that this was important. He was invited to the dedication ceremony of the cemetery that we're talking about today. So he takes a train into Gettysburg. You can visit the train station in Gettysburg where he got off, and then he stayed his first night, or his only night, in David Will's house. This is downtown. I mentioned David Will's a little bit earlier. He was the one who put forth the money to be able to purchase the land for the cemetery beyond. And so Lincoln spent the night in David Will's house. Uh, this is owned by the Park Service, too. You can go and visit that. You can actually see the bed where Lincoln slept in. Uh, how many people have been to the David Will's house? Okay, not as many as Gettysburg, but still, I, I would recommend if you're in Gettysburg again, go, go take a visit. Um, but on the morning of the 19th, um, they got up, and Lincoln uh, was rode on a procession through the town of Gettysburg and into the entrance that you can see kind of down on the right side of the cemetery there. Now, the cemetery didn't look like what it did in that, in that map, and it didn't look like any of the pictures that I showed you today. Uh, that large monument in the middle, that wasn't there. That wasn't completed um, until couple many years later and then as well as the graves they weren't all done yet uh, the grave markers weren't in and there was a lot of open pits soldiers were still being buried um, you know, it takes a while to bury all these guys so Lincoln rides in and if you take a look where the semicircle is kind of across that black line there they had a platform set up for him and um, here's some pictures from that day you can see the large picture there there's Lincoln uh, that's the only picture of Lincoln during the address. Um, and yeah, and so Lincoln was not the main speaker that day. That was a man, Edward Everett, the guy in the bottom right there. And he spoke for about two and a half hours. That seems like a long time. Um, we would not, I, I couldn't do that. Um, I wouldn't have you guys sit here for two and a half hours. Um, but in that time, they didn't have TV, they didn't have movies, you know, they, they liked doing that. They liked to go and listen to speeches things like that. This was not uncommon for there to be a two and a half hour long speech. And uh, how many people here have heard of Edward Everett? Anybody? Anybody heard? Oh, okay. Many more than I thought, yeah. Um, but, you know, he was sort of a celebrity back in the day then. I mean, you know, honestly, probably even a little bit more popular than, than Lincoln at the time. And so uh, he was very, very well known. And so after he spoke, uh, President Lincoln gets up and he speaks for about two minutes. And, that was very surprising. And so, again, with this picture, you notice he is sitting down, he's not standing. There's no picture of him actually giving the speech. And uh, we always like to say that's because uh, the photographer probably just didn't, didn't realize that it would only be two minutes long. And so, Lincoln got up, gave the speech, sat back down. Oh, I didn't even get my picture. So that's, that's the only picture we got. Um, but uh, from this, there's been a lot of a lot of mixed emotion afterwards. Many of Lincoln's political opponents said the speech was a failure, that it wasn't good. Nobody clapped. Well, nobody clapped initially, but again, they didn't think it was over. And so um, that is kind of why that, that came to be. But no, the speech was very um, renowned. People loved it. Edward Everett uh, wished to have a, a copy of it, a signed copy of it. He sent a very nice letter congratulating him on the speech and things like that. Um, but yeah, and that is how kind of the story of you know, one of the most influential speeches in American history uh, came to be. Uh, just some other notes about the cemetery, since I figured you guys would like to see some. Um, this just looks like a random picture, uh, but this is actually the picture of the cemetery uh, directly next to the National Cemetery, known as Evergreen Cemetery. This cemetery was there during the time of the battle, and the cluster of graves right across the fence there, that is where we like to say uh, is the place where the get happened. Uh, there is no marker, there is no official place to know where the Gettysburg Address happened. Uh, they built that stage and tore it down right after the, the ceremony. They really weren't thinking about it at the time. 
Uh, but based off of people over the years, that's the people have tried and tried and tried to figure out where it was. But we kind of narrowed it down to this general area of that cluster of graves that you're seeing right there. Uh, but yeah, and then just some other quick uh, places to note throughout the cemetery that I found interesting. Um, the one on the left, that is a Lincoln uh, bus that they put in in uh, 1913 for the anniversary of the battle. And um, so that's, that's in the cemetery. The rostrum up there you see on the top right, they give uh, all their speeches in the cemetery, Memorial Day services, and other, um, you know, the Remembrance Day stuff, and whenever they do the Gettysburg Address reading uh, on November 19th of each year. And um, the bottom right, that's the New York State Monument. They're one of, they're the only state to have their state monument in the cemetery. Um, that's pretty fitting. New York and Pennsylvania are the two uh, have the most uh, men buried in the cemetery from those states, so it's fitting that New York has their monument there. Um, now. How does this all connect? How do we how do we connect all that back to our soldiers? So, uh, a lasting legacy at Gettysburg. Um, first off, you know, whenever Lincoln talked in his speech, he talked about um, you know, freedom for all, a new, a new birth of freedom, is what he says, and um, how these men did not die in vain. And so, if we think back to our soldiers, uh, Pliny, Edmund, and Nelson, uh, we can think about their plans that they had, and how even though they were cut short, they helped Lincoln's plans and the nation's plans to be able to win the war and reunite as one nation. Um, and then as far as Gettysburg in general today, uh, you know, it's, it's a national park site that has over a million visitors a year. Um, you know, it's one of the most well-known battles in American history and world history, um, and it has a great significance. And so uh, I'm going to leave you with uh, a quote from the Gettysburg Address. Um, I will take questions afterwards if you would like. And, um, but yeah, so when I read this, I would invite you all to please think back on Pliny, Edmund, and Nelson and see how they can fit into this speech. I will end with this. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you so much. Anybody has any questions? Yes. How many soldiers did you say are, are buried in the cemetery? Uh, there's about around 3,500 soldiers buried in the cemetery, um, yeah. Are their names listed somewhere for um, history purposes? I think there, I think uh, the National Park Service might have a database online with all their names. They definitely do at like the visitor center, if, if you want to. And one last question, they were buried together as per the units that they served with? Uh, so it's by state, um, they would, state. yeah, they would try to bring the units together. Yeah. Um, you know, if they were in the same regiment, they would try to line them up in the same, same row and things like that, yeah, but it's by state for the wage. So we are each soldier's buried. Yeah. And no officers were signified by something special? They, it says on their on their stone, like it would say their, their rank and things, but there was no special order. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. What right happened to the Confederate soldiers? Yeah, so um, that's a very popular question that we get uh, at the cemetery. So we always like to say, you know, it was still wartime uh, during the, the time the cemetery was created. Um, so uh, the Confederates, they were seen as the enemy. And so to honor these soldiers, they would only bury the Union soldiers there. And so majority of the Confederate soldiers, uh, to answer your question, were just buried like, in the fields. They were given proper burials and stuff and, and buried out in the fields of the battlefield. Uh, but in the years following the war, uh, groups like uh, Daughters of the Confederacy, things like that, would uh, raise funds, and families would raise funds to come up and exhume the Confederates and, and take them back to the South. The majority of them are buried in Hollywood National Cemetery in, uh, in Richmond, and um, so that's where a lot of the Gettysburg Confederate soldiers ended up, was in, in, in Virginia. So. Mm -hmm. Yes? Talking about the Um. Total number of deaths, 
I'm not sure the number of deaths, but the number of casualties is in and around 50, 51,000 people estimate. So again, casualty, killed, wounded, uh, missing, or captured. So lots and lots of people. So. Uh, so they varied in age. Uh, Pliny, I think, was, uh, I believe he was around 18 or 19. I think it was 19. Um, Edmund was a little bit older, uh, probably like 23, I believe. And then, um, Nelson was around 18 or 19 as well. So pretty, pretty, pretty young. So, did you have a question? Were there any women buried there, like nurses who would kill them? Um, so, not Civil War. Uh, veterans or things like that. The cemetery is also like another, like at all other national cemeteries, they have um, uh, soldiers from other wars buried there. They buried people in the cemetery up until the 1970s. Uh, so you'll see uh, men who went to Vietnam buried there. But uh, not Civil War, uh, anybody, but uh, spouses of World War II veterans, Vietnam veterans, even some children. Uh, I think there's a couple, one or two year olds who, who passed away and are buried with no civil war uh, women in the Yes? How quickly were they buried? Um, so they didn't start uh, burying them until October. Um, so they had got, uh, I mean, they had buried them out in the fields. They had covered them up. Uh, so that, I mean, the farmers, when they returned, I mean, it's a, you can only imagine the smell and things like that. So they, they, they covered them up themselves. Uh, but they didn't start putting them in the cemetery until October. And um, there were some good uh, in, uh, sources out there saying like the frost had already occurred, the, the, the fall frost. So they weren't really, they kind of were halted in like their state that they were in. Um, so, and then going off of that, just some other information about that. Um, many of the local members of the community uh, aided in burying the members there. And uh, they, they kept meticulous notes of the items that were on the soldiers as they brought them in and things like that. That's why we have these documents that, that I was able to share with you today. Um, but yeah, so it took a lot of work, and, uh, but you did get paid for it. You got paid pretty good. I don't know the exact number, but uh, at the time it was a pretty decent amount per body that you, that you carried in. Uh, it's a little bit morbid, but it's, it's, it's how it went. So. Um, so I don't know too much personally about him. Um, I know his, his story at Gettysburg. I, I just pretty much know what I what I had said about you know um, his speech. I, I think I believe he was the president of Harvard at one point. I think um, I don't know. Don't quote me on that. But um, uh, other than what he did at Gettysburg with his address and, and at, the, at the dedication ceremony, I don't know too much more about. Him, so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like 13, 14,000 words or something like that. But I mean, people said it was a great speech. I do know that it was. People liked the speech, and um, you know, I haven't read it myself. I, I probably should, but, but yeah. Yes. How the Um. So a lot of the times. Um, Kind of depended. I mean, they would usually receive, if they could, some sort of like telegram, things like that. Um, and then, if not, uh, they would write letters, take it through the mail. Uh, like I know, Edmund, uh, his officer, uh, his commanding officer, actually wrote uh, his parents the letter about his death. And um, you know, uh, one one thing that I really liked in that letter was uh, they buried him under an apple tree, and. Uh, they, they made sure that was known. And then at the cemetery, in the picture that I showed, you can't see it, it's just the grave, but there's actually a tree right, right by the New Hampshire plot that kind of hangs over where he's buried. Um, I'm sure that wasn't on purpose when they were burying him in the cemetery, but I always thought that was really nice that, you know, they kind of stuck true to what, what they said. So. But yeah, so either letters or telegram, or sometimes they just wouldn't, no, sometimes they just wouldn't, wouldn't come home. Did you have a question here? Is there a copy of Everett's speech? Yeah, I think it's pretty well um, uh, distributed. You could probably find it online uh, if you just search up Edward Everett Gettysburg address speech. So. <coughs> no 
No other questions? No questions. <coughs> Oh yeah, mm -hmm, definitely. Um, the last body that I think was found was, let's say, early 2000s, I believe. I was a Confederate soldier. Uh, there's a big um, railroad cut there, and uh, so there's a lot of fighting in and around that. And a woman was walking her dog one day, and she saw just this bone sticking out of the of the, the ground, you know, with erosion and all that. And, she got it, picked it up, took it to the visitor center, and said, I found this. Like, I don't know if this is like human remains or not. Sure enough, it was. And so they go out there, they, they zoom it, and then they send it off for testing to see if they can identify um, you know, any bits of information they can. But yes, there, there's most definitely still some bodies out there. <laughs> All right, if there's no other questions, um, thank you so much.